Hey gang, thanks so much for joining us today. I want you to know that I just came off spring break with my family. We had a fantastic time and I want to share a quick tip for a filling meal that you can pack when you're taking an early morning flight and you don't want to be stuck without any healthy breakfast options. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to take a pouch of unsweetened applesauce and you're going to toss it in the freezer the night before. Now, the morning of your flight, you're going to toss the frozen applesauce in your bag along with a bag of our Plant Strong granola. My personal favorite is the chocolate. Also, pack a little Tupperware container with some frozen berries and a tight-fitting lid. And then a couple hours later on your flight or during your layover, add the cold applesauce to your now perfectly defrosted berries, top with granola, and dig in. I am telling you, this is the absolute best. It's a great way to fill up and stay fueled when you're on the road. And if you want to, you can throw in a dash of cinnamon to your berries when you pack. You can stock up on all four of our dessert-inspired whole fruit sweetened Plant Strong granola at plantstrongfoods.com. Now, let's dig into today's show. Well, for us, I was trying to narrow down what took us 10 years to really understand and give it to people so that in 10 days they had all the knowledge that they needed to give this thing a go. So, um, you know, I read a ton of books and did a lot of research and got certified in plant-based nutrition, but I wanted to give people something that was short and sweet, just enough information. Um, So in that day zero, it's some kind of um, initial questions people might have and then getting into the why. Why should I do this? Why is this good for the planet? Why is this good for me? Um, So just giving people some background and letting them know it's not going to take them 10 years. Um, They can read this and grab a hold of some other resources and they will be well on their way to eating happy. I'm Rip Esselstyn, and welcome to the Plant Strong Podcast. The mission at Plant Strong is to further the advancement of all things within the plant based movement. We advocate for the scientifically proven benefits of plant based living and envision a world that universally understands, promotes, and prescribes plants as a solution to empowering your health, enhancing your performance, restoring the environment and becoming better guardians to the animals we share this planet with. We welcome you wherever you are on your Plan Strong journey, and I hope that you enjoy the show. I have a confession to make, my Plan Strong brothers and sisters, and that is, ever since I interviewed my guest today, Rachel Brown, I can't stop exclaiming the title of her book, For Fork's Sake. I mean, it's just so fun to say. Go ahead and say it right now. For Fork's Sake. I mean, it's memorable, it's catchy, and it's definitely attention-grabbing. For Fork's Sake. I can't stop saying it. But there's something about it that just makes me happy, and that is precisely what we discussed today. Rachel's simple guidebook takes readers on a 10-day journey from the sad standard American diet to the happy diet, and that is healthy and plant-powered, yay. Now, are you ready to get happy? Well, it's inevitable as we talk through her family's journey and all of her trusted tips for making this transition. What does this way of eating even entail? And how do you bring your family along, especially if they're reluctant for the ride? How do you handle the naysayers and the questioners? What are some of the common misconceptions and pitfalls? And how do you handle the picky eaters in your family? This book is easily digestible, but packed full of so many tips. And as she says on her website, Changing your family's food, health, and life for the better doesn't have to be drastic. Transition to healthier, happier, whole food, plant-based, no oil eating with help from a mom who's done it. Here to talk us through how to do it is Rachel Brown. Rachel Brown, welcome to the Plant Strong Podcast. (laughs) 
Thank you, Rip. It's great to be here. Yeah, well, it's nice to have you. Tell me, where are you uh, talking to me from? So I'm just outside of Santa Cruz, California, in a little town called Scotts Valley. Santa Northern Cruz. Central. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So is Santa Cruz kind of a hippy-dippy place, or what, what's it like there? It does have that uh, that vibe a little bit. I think a little like Austin, you know, Portland, Santa Cruz. Those are all kind of in the same category, I think. Uh-huh. Well, I have a brother that used to live in Santa Cruz for a number of years, and I went to visit him, and I loved the the feel and just the vibe of, of Santa Cruz. I can't wait to get back. So, Rachel, let's yeah, let's dive in and talk about a book that you've recently written. It came out a couple months ago. It, here it is right here. It's called For Fork's Sake. And I love saying that. <laughs> and I love saying it really loud and with like a lot of like meaning. For Fork's Sake. How do you say it? <laughs> I the same really, and I, I say it multiple times a day sometimes. So yeah, for fork's sake, man. Yep. Yeah, for for fork's sake, come on, man. So tell me, how did you come up with this particular title? Because I am a huge fan. Well, thank you. You know, it was many iterations. I felt like I had a lot of titles, some titles that I was trying to work together, but I wanted something fun and catchy, something that wasn't too serious, but um, was attention grabbing. And it seems to have done the trick. Uh, Amazon won't allow me to run ads because of the title. So that has been a bit of a bit of a bummer, but uh, otherwise it, it does get some good reviews. Well, is that because they're confused? They think you're confusing fork with the F word or what's up with that with that? Yes. Well, first they tried to say, because I was purporting medical um, advice and uh, then I pointed out it was always, it was all research backed, fact checked medical advice. And so they withdrew that, but then they said, yes, that the, um, the fork part could be misconstrued to be something else and so they didn't want to run that i mean i'm kind of amazed with like pinky cole's book and there are a whole bunch of books out there that are you know amazing but it, yeah but but that, it's their their deal <laughs> yeah well we just had pinky uh pinky on the podcast uh a couple weeks ago um and what was her yeah. name of the book again was it slutty vegan <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the name of the restaurant chain right yeah it, no, no, right, it's, right. No, it's like <laughs> it's like eat this bitch, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I right. thought you were just trying to get me to say it. <laughs> no, I I wish I was that quick. Um, <laughs> but it's interesting. You have a you have a really I think powerful quote on page twenty two of your book, and it's the most violent weapon on earth is the table fork. And I didn't know if that's one of the reasons why you, you use that uh, fork in the name of your title. And that is actually an unknown, you know, who, who exactly said that, but it is so, so true. Right. right. It was originally attributed to Gandhi, actually. But um, when we did the fact checking, we couldn't nail that down for certain. But yeah, yeah, it really is proving to be true these days, just how violent our, our forks can be. <laughs> yes, across a, a, a myriad of different things. So your dedication to this, um, you say, to my husband and kids who tried the charred smoothie and lived <laughs> to tell about it. Thanks for uh, learning with me. And may you always remember you're getting enough protein. So tell me, what, like, what, how many kids do you have? I've got two kids. Um, they are turning 21 next week and uh, turning 19 in March. So our youngest is away at college this year. Both of them are in college now. So this is our first year's empty nesters. But they were six and eight when we made our transition almost 13 years ago. Um, so yeah, there was there was a big learning curve. And uh, that dedication, you know, especially when they were young, we did a lot of smoothies. It was an easy way to get a lot of greens in that they weren't too excited about just chomping on at the, at the time. And um, so yeah, I did a lot of smoothies. And one time I tossed in a whole bunch of chard and, you know, not cooked or anything. The thing was like fluorescent green you know like bright lime green it was beautiful but almost like a bad science experiment and uh i said yeah you gotta drink it you know and they took a drink and their eyes got really wide and i took a taste and i was like okay never mind this you don't have to drink this smoothie because it was high on the charred content 
<laughs> wow. And so you didn't you didn't slice it with some peanut butter and banana and uh, <laughs> lemon juice? Not enough. No, <laughs> exactly. I <laughs> yeah yeah. I learned my lesson, and from that day forward, a lot more lemon juice and yes, a little nut butter in there. <laughs> uh, and uh, and so has your husband been along for this ride and been a willing partner? Yes, you know, so much like you, he was into triathlons. Um, he did uh, half Ironmans and um, he mountain bikes a lot. We have great mountain biking around here. And um, he was pretty willing to jump on board. He and my daughter are both lactose intolerant. So um, that was an easy switch there. But he still had this idea that he wasn't going to have enough energy. He used to mountain bike with a group of guys every Wednesday for hours. And um, he'd always get a steak burrito on that day uh, so that he'd be powered up to go do his long ride. And, um, you know, we were eating this way at home, but he'd still get that once a week steak burrito. And then a couple weeks in a row, he didn't have time to run over and, and get it. There's a great taqueria across the street from his office. And um, he just ate some soup that we'd had from home. And he felt incredibly better without that steak burrito. And like, that was his aha moment was when he realized, oh, this thing that I thought was really helping me is actually, you know, it's actually hurting me. So um, that was that was his main transition. But yes, I mean, it's been, you know, it's probably 12 years ago as well. So yeah. And do you feel like you're, 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 did you say two boys or a boy and a girl? Is it two boys? Uh, older daughter, younger son. Okay. Okay. Two do you kids, feel yeah. like your daughter, your daughter and your son and your husband feel confident that they're getting all the protein they need now? Yes. You know, sometimes my son will text me like he'll still have friends that ask him. So I'm like, well, everybody knows soy is bad for you. And I'm like, which friend is this? You know, can, can I just text him? Like, are you kidding me? Um, so yes, they are. You know, my daughter, when she moved out of the dorm, she moved into a house with four other vegans. Um, and my son is eating completely plant-based at school, you know? And so when I talk to parents now, I'm like, you might find it hard to believe that the kids that you're having a hard time eat vegetables as elementary school age kids or something um, could be in college living out of your home, choosing to eat plants all on their own, but it, it really works. So yeah, they're, they're doing a great job and they are, they are confident. And I think mainly because they know how they feel they've, they've experienced the benefits themselves. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, nice, nicely done with your family. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to go through, and I don't want you to give me everything, but I want to go through your 10 days because you basically say uh, the book is for the most part, uh, it's a quick guide. Uh, and it you, you run through it 10 days to what you're using the acronym happy, right? Which stands for what? Healthy and plant powered. Yay. <laughs> It's, you know, whole food, plant-based, no oil is hard to like, woof -a -a but no, you know, I mean, this is a hard one to go. So I thought sad to happy. Yeah, no, it's, to me, it's absolutely brilliant. Sad, meaning the standard American diet to happy. It's, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's brilliant. So what I want to do is let me just toss out uh, to you a little something from each one of the days. And then if you could, uh, if you could riff on that, I think that would be really beneficial for the listener. Um, so first day zero, you have a day zero and, <laughs> and basically that you say from 10 years to 10 days. So it's a little bit uh, ambiguous for somebody at home that does, hasn't read the book. What does that mean? Well, for us, I was trying to narrow down what took us 10 years to really understand and give it to people so that in 10 days they had all the knowledge that they needed to give this thing a go. So, um, you know, I read a ton of books and did a lot of research and got certified in plant-based nutrition, but I wanted to give people something that was short and sweet, just enough information. Um, so in that day zero, it's some kind of um, initial questions people might have and then getting into the why. Why should I do this? Why is this good for the planet? Why is this good for me? Um, so just giving people some background and letting them know they do, it's not going to take them 10 years. Um, they can read this and grab a hold of some other resources and they will be well on their way to eating happy. Yeah. And there's so much wonderful information out there that makes it so much easier than you know, some of these pioneers that did it, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Um, 
So tell me like personally, before we jump into the days, what was it that inspired you to like, even like go down this path? Uh, I'm sure there was some sort of a trigger. Yeah. So, um, you know, I grew up healthy. I played sports. Um, I was really active and, um, in my early twenties, I was told I had high cholesterol and, this was mainly concerning to me because my dad had high cholesterol and he had always been on cholesterol medication ever since I could remember. Um, and he would take cholesterol medication and then he'd have some side effect, like lose his taste or something and he'd switch medications. And I just knew I didn't want to do that if I didn't have to. And then um, in my mid twenties, my nephew was diagnosed with cancer. He was five years old and his mom was in nursing school at the time. And she had a professor who asked her if she'd looked at the role of nutrition in cancer. And that professor suggested some books. And my sister-in-law at the time, they had like a small hobby farm. I mean, when she'd come to my house, she taught me how to pull mozzarella cheese. So we were making cheese and we had chickens and they had chickens and uh, they grew in their meat. She had a huge veggie garden as well, but it was, it was kind of the whole, you know, homesteading thing. Um, but she started reading these books and they started overnight. They were doing like Gerson therapy and um, just fully went in to plant-based eating. And um, when she passed these books on, I started with the China study. I watched Forks Over Knives. And honestly, I was mad. I was mad that nobody had told me this information. You know, every time I went to the doctor and was told I had high cholesterol, they'd say, well, exercise a little bit more, which I was already doing and maybe cut out some cheese and eggs. You know, that was, that was all they gave me. So, um, so finding out this information made me mad, but then, um, really glad that this was actually possible, that I wouldn't have to take medication for the rest of my life. Uh, my dad's dad had Alzheimer's and um, he passed away from pancreatic cancer. My uncle, my dad's brother also died of pancreatic cancer. So, um, you know, there were some family reasons that in, in looking at disease and, and disease that were in our family, uh, there were big reasons to be as healthy as possible. So finding out that what I put in my mouth was you know, lifestyle, all of that was 90% of whether I got a disease, not, you know, fearing this, oh gosh, I'm going to get Alzheimer's, I'm going to get pancreatic cancer, what can I do kind of thing was just uh, really enlightening. And I want to share it with everybody I know. Yeah. And it's, it's remarkable to me how, you know, it seems like your first introduction to this was a friend that told you, hey, you should check out the China study. It's amazing what the China study has done. Same thing with the documentary Forks Over Knives. Um, it's it's really remarkable. So so grateful that that those that those are out there. All right, so let's move on to day number one. Okay, so day number one, and and, and again, we're doing just kind of. I want you to do an abbreviated version because <laughs> we don't want we don't want you to tell people exactly what the book's about and it's. <laughs> Clarity, but day one is what eating plant-based, what it entails. Well, for the most part, I, I think breaking down for most people, you know, maybe or maybe not, they've heard the term whole food, plant-based, no oil. So just breaking down, like, what are we even talking about and trying to put it in really simple terms, you know, like don't eat anything with a face or a mother and you've got it pretty much covered. You know, some, some easy things to remember. Um, I like your crap calorie rich and processed stuff, you know, trying to avoid things that aren't real foods. Um, so figuring out what, what it means to not eat oil and is that even possible? Um, how do you even start to think about that? But uh, yeah, breaking down what it is to eat whole food, plant-based, no oil or happy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're pretty, you're pretty keen on the no oil too, aren't you? <laughs> we are. And, you know, I have to thank your dad for that because watching these studies or watching him in action with people, I mean, it just sticks in my memory from Forks Over Knives when he had somebody who was eating healthy, keeping the food journal, all that. And then um, I want to say it was the spouse or something had added in like two tablespoons of, of olive oil, like throughout the week and their numbers shot up. And um, we have had that experience. I mean, we did genetic testing, found out we're APOE, my son and I and my dad. So down that line, um, APOE 4.3. So it's important to us to not add any extra cholesterol, to not add any extra saturated fats. Um, 
yeah, just, just for the health of our arteries and, and our body overcreates cholesterol anyway. So we're really careful about the added oil and, um, that one catches, I mean, a lot of people can jump on board with not eating animals, but they're like, whoa, 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 you know, I, I can't have olive oil. How am I supposed to cook? So yeah, trying to debunk some of those myths. Yeah, the, the, the oil is a hard one for a lot of people to get their heads heads around. You mentioned APE4, APE, I think it was something 4-3. What, so was that, is that, a, uh, is that something that uh, makes it harder for you to clear out cholesterol? Yeah, so the APOE um, gene, everybody has one of six of those genes. So um, this, like my favorite way to describe it is when people say red wine and chocolate are good for you. Well, maybe for people on one end of those six genes, their bodies deal with it easier, process it differently. On the other end, it's going to be horrible. Uh, those people's bodies won't deal with it. And then the people in the middle could probably go, you know, either way. Uh, but yes, the APOE 4-4 is that genetic predisposition for those are people who get Alzheimer's in their 40s and 50s. Um, so we're not at that extreme, but we're the we're one step in from that. So and, you know, our doctor recommended just because of our high cholesterol, even when we initially had cut out some things and, and my cholesterol, I mean, really, what did it for me was when we did this for 10 days, my cholesterol dropped 50 points. And my doctor said, what are you doing? Whatever you're doing, keep doing it because I couldn't do that with medication. And I knew I didn't want to be on medication. So, um, so yeah, when our cholesterol was kind of hovering and not dropping anymore, he said, you know, we could do this genetic testing, but I wouldn't unless there were some other family history, but then finding out about my grandfather and uncle who had pancreatic cancer and my grandfather had Alzheimer's, my dad's now in early stages of Alzheimer's. So, um, it was worth it to us to, to do the testing. But that being said, learning that that's really only 10%, you know, uh, 90% is lifestyle what we're doing. So um, it's helpful to know, but not not necessary. Well, and, and I've had the Shure's eyes on the podcast as well and read their books. And they, you know, yeah. even if you have the, I think you said it was the APOE uh, 44 yeah. that, you know, that, mm -hmm. It gives you a greater predisposition for Alzheimer's. Again, it's like this lifestyle can totally help build a fortress uh, from you acquiring that uh, that disease. Um, yeah. So let's move on. Let's move on to day number two, um, which you know you talk about how to make this. Uh, this way of eating successful and lasting. Um, that's a, that's a trick. So what are your thoughts? Yeah. You know, I talk about knowing yourself. I think it's really helpful to, to pause and go, how do I normally do things? You know, am I a black and white person? Am I somebody who dives all in and I'm ready to clean out my fridge and my cupboards and, you know, give this stuff away rather than hide it in the garage for a while? Um, or am I somebody, am I more of a slow adopter? Am I going to be somebody who wants to add in something helpful once a day or, you know, pick a few things every week? So starting with that will be more helpful um, because you're going to tend to do things like you've always done things. So, um, you know, if you're a slow starter, but you jump all in, it, that might be difficult. So just knowing yourself and then attacking this uh, with gusto from however works best for you. So I think that's a great starting point and necessary to kind of get you on the right track though, um, when you're looking at, at doing this. So you can go either way, the, the end goal is the same. Um, I think it's helpful for people to, if they can do it in 10 days, get the blood work before and after, because you really notice such a difference when you give up everything. Um, when you get rid of all the oil and the animal products, you're just, you will notice in your body such a benefit so rapidly and not that it won't happen, you know, longer over time if you're adding in things, but, and slowly getting rid of things, but you'll just, it'll be so profound. I think if you do it uh, in 10 days. So setting people up for success there. How did you come up with the number 10? Why 10 days? Why not nine or eight or, or seven? Like I, <laughs> I, you know, one of my books was the engine Two seven day rescue diet. So why 10? Yeah. Yeah. I've got that book. It's a great one. Um, you know, 10 really was more around, um, two weeks, about every two weeks, our taste buds change. So, um, it was a, a number that you could grab a hold of and, um, 
and give yourself enough time in that, um, you know, sometimes around day two or three, you might not be feeling awesome if you've given up, you know, sugary junk that you're used to or, you know, high fat stuff. Your body might be crying out for those things that it's missing. Um, but, you know, by that seven to 10 day mark, you're really noticing the benefits. You're probably already feeling so much better energy wise, you know, sleep wise, digestion wise, your skin might be clearing up all these amazing things that can happen in just 10 days. But to your point, you know, I had to put a disclaimer in the beginning of the book, because if you're on high blood pressure medication, or you're taking insulin, it might only be two days. If you go all in, you might need to lower your medication. So things can happen so rapidly. But 10 days felt like a a safe t amount of time to really give it to get into kind of some new habits and really experience the benefits. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I agree. I think 10 is a great number for that. Uh, you have a quote in your book and you have a lot of great quotes. You start off each chapter with, I think, a really compelling and um, uh, contemplative qu quote. But this one, knowledge is knowing <laughs> that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. And that's <laughs> so true because I don't think I've ever put a sliced tomato in a fruit salad. It just doesn't go well. But on day three, you're all about making kind of some, um, some nice, easy replacements as you're kind of getting into this lifestyle. Like, give me some examples. Yeah, so I encourage everybody to sit down with their family or their partner, or if it's just them to make a list of your favorite foods, you know, what are your favorite meals? So our kids, when we started this, they were six and eight, like I said, and on that list was, you know, um, enchiladas and lasagna and cheeseburgers and, you know, uh, those kind of foods. So we made a list of their favorite foods. And um, then I just started to look up recipes that were whole food, plant-based, no oil versions of those same foods. So I highly recommend that um, people don't don't try and uh, go just to salads. You know, you're not going to last if you just are giving up everything you used to eat and you move to just eating salads. I mean, there are some amazing salads out there. I think I could do that now for sure. But you know, if you if your kids or you love a uh, macaroni and cheese bake, there are some amazing macaroni and cheese bakes that you can make that are plant based. We make a lasagna that we feed to friends and family who aren't plant based, and they don't really know it's even plant based because it's got a lot of chewy mushrooms in it. And you know, so there are a lot of foods that you can kind of use as a transition or a gateway into getting into, you know, as your tastes are changing, as your taste buds are reawakening and changing, literally, um, you can eat some of your favorite foods, just make them plant-based. Yeah. So you mentioned gateway, which leads me to day four, where you also talk about some transition foods and how, to, and what are, in your mind, what are like some transition foods that fit into this 10 day, uh, kind of jumpstart. Yeah. So, you know, I honestly, in transition foods, I really mean more foods that you're used to eating, but that are whole food, plant-based, no oil. So I'm not talking about like highly processed vegan hot dogs. I'm talking about a carrot dog that you, you know, marinate and you make at home. So this is a hard thing because these days, you know, 13 years ago, it was harder to find recipes for plant-based foods, you know, whether on the internet or in a cookbook. Nowadays, there's tons. But also, when you go to the store, it can be confusing for people who are new on this journey to see all these vegan cheeses and sausages and lunch meats and bars and all this stuff. But when you look at the ingredients, you can't pronounce the ingredients. There's 400 ingredients, you know. Um, so I, I, I tend not to uh, point people in the direction of eating, uh, you know, junk vegan food. Some people can use it as a transition, you know, to get off their pastrami sandwich or something. Maybe they use a, you know, a, a Reuben meat or something, you know, to make their, their normal thing. But as, as much as possible, I would suggest, you know, making some whole food plant-based versions of your favorite foods. Yeah. I know that's, that's what we did at the fire station and how I was able to help get a bunch of you know, burly Texas male firefighters to do this by doing, you know, plant-based burgers, plant-based shepherd, shepherd's pies, plant-based lasagnas, plant-based pizzas, all that good stuff. Um, you yeah. mentioned, you mentioned carrot dogs. Um, do you have a favorite, favorite way of, 
of cooking up uh, a, a carrot dog? Because if you do carrot dogs right, they rock. Hey, it's one of those things that I initially poo-pooed, like, seriously, come on, a carrot dog. And then we've probably tried four different recipes, and I've liked them all, honestly. But, man, a little bit of liquid smoke in there really makes the difference. I mean, it just gives it that amazing kind of barbecue flavor, even if you're not going to barbecue it, even if you're going to, you know, cook it in your oven or whatever. Um, but yeah, I don't think you can go wrong with a carrot dog and kids love those things. You know, it, it's so fun. Yeah. To me, it just, it has to get soft enough. It can't be hard. It's got to be like soft all the way through a little bit of liquid smoke, Yeah. put it on that bun with all the fixings, you know, whether it's onions, relish, you know, uh, everything that you like, yep. and you're, you're, you're in, Carrot dog business. <laughs> yes, I think it is key. You've got to marinate them for quite a long time, maybe even overnight. Uh, that's how the ones we like to get that texture, right? But yes, I mean, it's like burgers to me. I, I never really liked, it wasn't hard for me to give up burgers because I like all the fixings on top. It's not so much the meat for me. So I, you know, a carrot dog with everything on it, so delicious. A, you know, black bean burger with everything on it, it doesn't get any better. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to day number five. Now that I have a carrot dog flavor in my mouth, what are what are <laughs> what have you found, Rachel, or some of the, like the common pitfalls that people um, jump into or fall into, and how can we avoid them? Well, I mean, just from the get go, I would say oftentimes people won't even give it a go because they think um, this is going to be really expensive or I don't have the time to do this. Those are two of the biggest ones up front that people say. And, you know, or I don't live next to a Whole food, so I can't do this, you know. Um, so I like to dispel those. You know, those are major pitfalls right out of the gate. You're going to save money. You're not going to spend any more time eating this way than you do already. You have to cook food to eat. So, um, you know, when you take out the shopping for that meat, fish, you know, dairy, eggs, all that, the prepping of the meat, chicken, fish, all that, you know, you're not, you're not doing any of that anymore. You got plenty of time to um, chop some vegetables or pull vegetables out of the freezer. You know, um, if you're, if you're feeling time constrained or money constrained, there are ways to do this that make things even easier. And, um, yeah, even college students, even 10 year olds, I, I added Jeff Novick's soup recipe that he came up with when his daughter was 10 years old and he needed something for his daughter to be able to make when she got home from school before he got home from work. Um, he says famously, you only need a can of butter and a pair of scissors to make this soup. And it's really true. I mean, it's frozen vegetables, it's canned beans, canned tomatoes. You make a batch of that and, and you've got food for the whole week. Um, so yeah, there's some really easy ways to stay out of pitfalls that are, that are common. Yeah. <clears throat> and you have a quote in here as well that I, that I adore. And I think it's so apropos, especially considering what I've seen over the last uh, 13 years since I've been coaching people and helping people. And, and the, here's the quote. It's not that some people have willpower and some people don't. It's that some people are ready to change and others are not. And that's by James Gordon, uh, MD. Um, so I, I find that when you want something bad enough, you just make it work. You figure it out. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, all those pitfalls just become little like, yeah, they're, they're little hurdles along the way. But, you know, you get you get over them and, and you and you're you're, you're just <laughs> you don't get hung up on them. Right. And they're not going to be the excuse that drives you away from this lifestyle. True. It's just like the, the famous right now, everybody's saying, right, the choose your heart. Right. And yeah, so some things are uh, take a little more time or take some getting used to. I would argue it doesn't actually take more time, but maybe it's a new way of doing things. And that's always a little challenging. But like you said, in a little bit of time, it's going to be new normal for you. And I would argue that choosing this new way of learning to eat and a new lifestyle um, more than pays off in the long run when you're not choosing to live with disease or ill health or pay more in medical bills and medications and all that down the road. So yeah, it's a great trade-off. Yeah. And for people that think, oh my gosh, there's what, you know, you're just starting and you, you think, what am I going to eat? There's like nothing to eat. As you said earlier, I'm just going to eat salads. And for people, I think that want to level set and realize how absolutely good we have it 
take the hungry for change challenge, which you, I think in your family or your husband took, will you tell everybody a little bit about that challenge and, um, and what that entails? Yeah, Nathan George, um, great man. He's back in England now, but, um, this was a challenge that you could do. You would, um, send away for this box and you got a box and uh, it was enough food. It was your food for the week. So in it was a bag of rice and a bag of beans and a bag of oats. And um, basically the challenge was to eat like 90% of the world eats um, for a week. And then the money that you didn't spend, you were, you were also allowed a cup of black coffee or black tea, more of the country or more of the world drinks black tea. Um, you could add in like some onion and, and stuff to your beans if you wanted. But basically you got like a cup of oatmeal in the morning and about a cup and a half. I think it, it worked out to be of rice and black beans for lunch and dinner. And um, it was just meant to show you that a lot of people, this, this is what they they have all the time, you know? Um, and so at the end of the week, you would give the extra money that you saved from all the other stuff that you weren't eating and you donate that to some um, organization wherever you felt like you wanted to. And um, it was just such a wonderful practice. My, my daughter was in elementary school and um, we told them they could add in some of their foods, you know, and um, they have fruit, but really they, they had the same thing as we did. And, um, she found this like a uh, game that was like um, you did math pro problems online and you would earn some rice and it would go to children who were hungry. So it was like just this um, catalyst for change. We're thinking differently about the food that we have and the food that we choose to eat. And, um, you know, anytime we would get kind of like, oh, okay, I'm maybe missing a little something or I'm feeling kind of bored with what we're eating, we would go back to doing kind of our own version of the hungry for change and just eat rice and beans for a few days eat some plain oatmeal. Uh, and it makes you really thankful in a short amount of time for all these amazing things you can, you know, add back in plant based things, toppings for your rice and beans and, you know, corn tortillas and salsa and all this other stuff that we enjoy all the time. But it really was um, what it really was a game changer for us to think about what we have differently. You know, it's interesting, because I, I, that box of oatmeal, black beans and rice. That's like practically what I subsist on. Right. And there's some you know, p potatoes yeah. and some fruits and some, you know, veggies in there, but I would adore that. And, um, to me, you're, you're getting every, almost everything you need right there in those three food groups. And I used to Rachel back before I had children every year, I would cross the Rio Grande river and I'd go into Mexico, uh, usually mountain bike. And we would leave our mountain bikes with a goat herder named Felipe. And then we'd go up into the Sierra del Madre uh, mountains there. And I kid you not, what he had for breakfast, lunch, and dinner was homemade corn tortillas over a, uh, basically a, a barrel that he turned into a, a stove and an oven. And then also he had refried pinto beans. And that's what he had for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And he also had some limes, but it's like, we have it so good, so easy. And there is such a cornucopia of offerings for us that, you know, it's like open your eyes and realize this is not difficult. <laughs> Yeah. And, and all that we have is, you know, we think it's such, a, such an amazing thing and so wonderful, but it, it can get us into trouble having all these options, you know, yeah. suddenly we're not happy and we have so much and it, it sometimes takes like pairing back. We go down to um, Tecate, Mexico and build homes and, um, it's so easy to eat plant-based down there. Just like you said, you know, there's corn, there's always corn tortillas. There's always beans. There's always lime. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing, super simple, but super satisfying. I'm going to, I'm going to jump day six and go right to day seven. And you mentioned earlier that your kids started this when they were, I think, six and eight, roughly. Um, yeah. so how did you please your kids and what do you do to get a picky, picky eater on board? Yeah, I included some um, ideas for that just because I think um, my son was a lot more picky than my daughter was. He was a couple years younger. Um, and, uh, you know, it, just things like cut the color green, <laughs> didn't want to eat, you know, so the, hence the smoothies with a ton of blueberries to make it, you know, purple bluish rather than green. Um, but, you know, just employing some different kind of tricks and tips, you know, we would make dinner a game time. So, 
for a while, he didn't like eating soup. I don't know why, but we made the soup game, which was like, close your eyes and I'll give you a bite. Can you tell me what vegetable it is? You know, and he would get it wrong like nine times out of 10, but he loved playing the game, you know? So um, he'd always say, ooh, it's white broccoli. <laughs> I'd be like, right, that's cauliflower. So um, he loved that game. Uh, coming up with some other things, I, I read about this thing in some mom journal and it was like a jar of questions, you know? So pulling out a jar um, having it on your table, everybody gets to pull out a, a question and then you answer it as you're sitting there. I think honestly, in consulting with people now and talking with young families, part of what's so hard is that a lot of people aren't pausing to sit down and eat meals together. Or if they're sitting down, they're looking at a tablet or a phone or, you know, it's, it's just not... Um, it's not kind of that sacred space that it used to be, or maybe, you know, older folks like me <laughs> grew up with. So yeah, encouraging families, especially with young kids to um, make it an enjoyable time together, you know, asking questions and listening. And when you're engaged in conversation and having fun or asking, you know, your older sibling or younger sibling, a question that you got to pick out of a jar, it can be really fun. And if you're hungry, if you haven't had a string cheese and some goldfish, you know, an hour ago, but you were out outside playing or having a dance party, you know, while helping cook dinner, then you're going to be hungry and you're actually going to eat what's in front of you. So yeah, some, some tips like that. You know what? I, I, I like all those and we, we have made it a habit now. I'd say five out of the seven days we set the table. We have a, a lazy Susan table. It's in the dining room now that used to be just like where people would leave stuff. And we leave all the screens behind and then every dinner we go around and we do the rose thorn game. So what's an, a good thing that happened to you today? And what's something that was kind of a pain in your side? And it's awesome because everybody gets a chance to talk. We're, we're eating, we're, you know, we're eating the, this wonderful whole plant-based food. And as you said, this has become sacred time for us and everybody enjoys it now. So, yeah. Um, yeah. We, we did the high, low, what the heck. That was our version of the rose thorn. So a high from the day, a low, and a what the heck. And you learn something, oh. right, from every person. It's, it's really fun. I like what the heck. Well, I'll, I'm going to add that tonight. So high, low, and so what the heck is kind of like something crazy and wild that happened to you? Yeah, yeah, something weird. You didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. Or it was just like, yeah, this, this odd thing today happened, you know? I like that. All right. Good, good, good. Um, all right. Let's talk about day eight, which you talk about eating out. And this is something that everybody wants a break from cooking now and then. Uh, and it's nice to have strategies to make it work with, you know, Chinese, Japanese, Indian, Italian, Mexican. How do you recommend we eat out? Yeah, I would say this is something that has changed a lot in 13 years. I'm, I'm sure you would agree. Like there are options, a lot of places that there didn't used to be options. But um, even if you're eating somewhere where there aren't options, even if you're in a traditional steakhouse, you now know what plants are, what whole foods are, right? So you can order a baked potato. You can order three sides of veggies. You know, if they've got a green that they'll cook or they've got broccoli or something, you can load that on your potato. Um, a side of beans, maybe baked beans or something. You can make it work at a steakhouse. A lot of times, yeah, um, more um, ethnic restaurants have vegetarian options already. Um, and so it's not that hard to make a change from a vegetarian option to a vegan option. I, the one thing with eating out is that we've just mainly accepted you're probably going to have some oil. I mean, we will try. There's some tactics you can try to to not have oil or lessen your oil consumption. But um, but yeah, it's really not as hard as you think it might be. You know, if you're out running errands and you're starving and you forgot to bring something, you can go to a Subway or a sandwich shop and get a loaded veggie sandwich. Just tell them to put all the veggies on there with some mustard and, you know, maybe a little vinegar. And you've an amazing lunch. So um, once you know a few tricks and once you've got down what is whole food and plant-based and no oil, you'll be able to find what you need. Yeah. Um, you can even go to Taco Bell and actually <laughs> yes. I'm really close to making it work there. And I had a, I had a guest yep. on the podcast that uh, she totally recommended Taco Bell. <laughs> 
<laughs> my son, uh, my son yeah. and his friends would be Taco Bell. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk, let's move on to day number nine. And this is something that is very real. And it's something that people that are just jumping into this lifestyle are going to encounter. And that's people asking you a lot of questions like what in the world are you doing? And I'm going to tee you up right now. So what do you say? What's your response, Rachel? When somebody says, Rachel, you got to be kidding me. This is the most extreme thing that, that, that you and your family have ever done. And we have no interest in this. Yeah. So I've learned a lot in this area um, over the years, Rip, and it really depends on who's asking me now. You know, when we started out, we were like preachers. We wanted to tell everybody about this and how they needed to do this and how it was going to just change their life and be so amazing. And we quickly realized if we wanted to have some friends, we needed to like tone it down a little bit. So, um, so we backed off. And well, who um, needs friends, Rachel? Come on, I know, overrated. I know, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just were like, oh, no, I think people are avoiding us in line for the potluck, you know, so um, I, I just take a varied stance now, you know, if somebody is like combative in their question, I might employ one of Doug Wiles tactics, which I just love and, and say, yeah, you're right, I might not be getting what I'm needing, I might die next week of protein deficiency. And just leave it at that, you know, because then they're kind of caught off guard and like, what? Are you serious? You know, yeah. um, or I might just say, yeah, you know what? It, my doctor said that I should eat this way and it seems to be working for me, you know, mm -hmm. so take like a non-aggressive stance. Other times I channel my Dr. McDougal and um, I, I just let him have it and I give him, you know, some statistic or um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll argue. Uh, but yeah, I try not to let it get the better of me because I would just be so frustrated in trying to share this information kind of back to the very beginning. You know, if people aren't ready for it, then um, they're going to they're going to have every excuse in the world. And we realize that talking about food is like talking about sex or religion. I mean, people are really up in arms sometimes about what they eat and why. So even if they don't know why they eat what they eat, even if they don't know the science behind it, they still will defend it. So um, yeah, choose your battles, I guess is what I would say. <laughs> so you, in the book, you talk about, you know, how if somebody was to say, was to say, this is really, <laughs> Rachel, this is rather extreme. You use my father's uh, quote from Forks Over Knives. Can, do you remember what that is? Can you Yeah, that? I mean, some people think it's extreme, but, you know, some people think, think it's extreme to get your chest cut open and have a, you know, vein from your leg put in your, you know, a, a heart, like otherwise known as bypass surgery, right? So, yeah, yeah. I love that quote. I yeah. It's so true. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I agree. I like it too. That to me is the extreme thing. Think about it. Getting your chest sawed in half, all these ribs, right? Because you can't figure out the oatmeal, the black beans, the salads, the green leafies. Um, yeah. But hey, you know, we all know people that they're just not interested. Um, One of the hardest things that I have found working with people is people staying on track, right? It's amazing how people fall off the, the engine, fall off the wagon. Um, so what in day 10, you're all about ways to stay encouraged and to stay on track. What, what advice would you give to us? Yeah, well, first of all, I think if you've done those, if you've given it your all for those 10 days and you did get a blood draw before to find out your numbers and you got a blood draw at the end, you know, to see some of those things that you maybe weren't feeling, you know, you might have felt up and down over that 10 days, but you don't really feel your cholesterol dropping. So when you get your blood work back and go, oh my gosh, my cholesterol dropped, you know, 20 to 75 points or whatever, um, that's usually really good news for people. But um, yeah, you know, I think having other success stories around, having reminders as to why you're doing this are really helpful. So, yeah, I put a list of um, some documentaries. If, if people haven't watched Forks Over Knives, Game Changers, I mean, those are the top two. What the hell? I mean, there's so many now um, to choose from. I'm like, watch one a week, you know? Um, Hop on YouTube, search out some people, check out Dr. Gregor, Dr. McDougal. I mean, there's amazing things you can watch and learn from these days. Um, Plant Strong, Chef AJ, I mean, there's so many different 
resources now to be encouraged and to hear other success stories, where they've been, how they made it through. Um, I think that's one of the best ways to stay on track is to, if you're, if you're wavering to check out a success story, to, to be reminded again as to, um, yeah, it might be a little difficult in the beginning, but um, here's why you're doing it. And here's how, how other people have done it. You feel, you might feel lonely in this, but once you start learning, there, there is a large worldwide community of people who eat this way. Um, it might feel like swimming upstream in your community um, or in your circle, but there are a lot of people who are making this work and who are thriving eating this way. So learning who those people are, where they are and getting involved. Yeah, very much so. And join a community whether it's local or online, um, you know, we have a great one at Go Plan Strong with, uh, you know, over 25,000 people, but know that you're not alone out there for sure. Yeah. Um, Rachel, do you have a favorite meal of the day? Ooh, you know, probably breakfast. I, I am not somebody who can skip breakfast. So I always look forward to breakfast. Um, and I can go sweet or savory. I think I tend more towards savory than sweet really. Um, but we do like overnight oats loaded with all kinds of good stuff, you know, dates, cranberries, all that. So that would be, I guess, technically sweet, but, um, yeah, I, I, I like the, you know, king as breakfast, you know, eat like a king at breakfast. I could, I could, if I only had to eat one meal, I would eat breakfast. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I can't go without breakfast. If it gets to be 930 and I haven't eaten breakfast, my, everything in me is grumbling. <laughs> yes, yes. Even my mouth sometimes. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. You have, a, you have another quote that I'm going to read that I really like, and it's, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish. And he'll empty the seas by 2050 and we'll, all, we'll, and we'll all die. You should teach a man to cook lentils. Um, and I can't remember who said that quote, if that's you or what, but. Um, no, it's somebody yeah. else. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I love it. And I, the only thing I would add to that is maybe teach a man to grow lentils. <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, and you, you do a great job in the book talking about what's going on, you know, as far as the how the planet is in such peril right now because of how we're, <laughs> for the most part, how, how we're eating. And um, and that's to me is why this quote is so is so important. It's like we, we got to pivot uh, people and we got to pivot fast to lentils to oats to black beans to rice and get off the fish and the chicken and the dairy and the beef and the turkeys as fast as humanly possible yeah all the all the uh, riding our bikes and you know converting to electric cars and all that we do it's not that it's not helpful but it's not going to take care of the problem and yes this agriculture livestock issue that we've go got going on um it has to be addressed so yeah What's uh, anything that you're working on right now? Uh, and, and, and before you answer that question, let me ask you this. Did you self-publish this book for Fork's sake? I did, actually. Yeah, yeah. It was a um, COVID venture for me. I, I was working with people, helping them get out of chronic pain using a neurological technique. I've been doing massage for the last 10 years. And um, when COVID hit and I couldn't see clients, um, I decided to write our journey. You know, I'd, I'd spent years trying to convince people to eat this way and, and learned a few things. And so um, I, I wanted to, I went back on my plant-based nutrition certificate and I wanted to help as many people as possible. So um, this was my effort at doing this. And when I talked to people and especially younger people, they told me, I don't read books really anymore. You know, I might listen to audiobooks, or there's no way I'm going to read the China study, you know? And so um, while I still think that is seminal work and everybody should read it, I was hoping to create something that would be really easy to grab a hold of. You know, you can listen to on a four hour flight. If you listen to audiobooks, you can read it in a short period of time, but give people enough information to um, see that it's not as daunting as they might think. And um, like I said, there's so many amazing resources out there, but I was hoping to write a book that was, you know, for people who maybe not, it wouldn't pick up um, a heavier scientific read or um, 
people who are eating this way and had parents who are like, what are you doing to my grandkids? You know, you can give them a copy of this book. So, um, yeah, this, this was my aim at that. So on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the most difficult and one being easy, where would you place putting together and writing this book? <laughs> You know, writing was a really easy part. I did it actually in 30 days. I did this like, um, you know, write a memoir kind of thing in 30 days and then um, just worked to tweak it into what it is, making it a 10 day kind of challenge. Um, to me, the part I didn't really understand, I thought like, great, you write a book, you get it out there and ta-da, you're done. You know, like, oh my gosh, the marketing stuff, like this is more work than than the writing the book, you know, this, this phase of trying to get out there and spread the word as much as possible. So, um, yeah, I would say it was a, you know, writing, it was really fun. That was like, awesome. Put it at a five with the marketing stuff, it's like an eight and a half, nine amount of work. Uh, but yeah, you know, hearing from people, getting emails from people, I'm, I'm consulting. So if people read the book or if they've read other books and they're like, yeah, I'm at a plateau, I'm stuck, or my family misses me, you know, what should I do? Um, I'm consulting with people and, you know, that's a lot of fun to get people, give them just some other ideas for getting over a hump that is not insurmountable. Um, people writing emails saying, you know, I'm saving $400 a month on groceries and medication now, you know, um, just all these different amazing success stories just since the book came out in September. So that's really fun. And uh, yeah, makes makes staying on the marketing train worth it, I guess. <laughs> For anybody that's interested in consulting with you, how do they get a hold of you? Um, so on my website, uh, www.forforksakebook.com, um, there's a page on there for consulting and I've got a calendar and you can just sign right up. For fork's sake. <laughs> let me, let me, for wait. fork's sake. For fork's sake. Rachel, let me tell you that the marketing never ends. It never ends. And, <laughs> and, and uh, right, Rip. <laughs> well, it, I mean, it can end if you decide, you know what, I'm done. But <laughs> otherwise you got to figure out ways to embrace it and, uh, and uh, give it the love that it that it deserves because you're you're one of many very important voices in getting people to to go whole food plant based and uh, and man oh man does this earth ever need more people like you so I want to yeah. Uh, yeah go ahead well I was just gonna say I and you know I should say it's more like you know social media posting and that stuff that I probably wouldn't choose to do, but it, it is fun. And I really, my, my writing this book was like a thank you to people like your father and you, your mother, your sister, you know, uh, John McDougal, other, other T. Colin Campbell, you know, people who have spent their lives trying to get this message across and our family, I mean, we reversed heart disease, you know, um, your dad's book wasn't huge in that. Um, yeah, I wanted to give back. So, I, I donate 50% of the proceeds from the sale of the book to charity and 1% of gross sales is going to 1% for the planet. So this really is my effort at just spreading the word as much as I can. And I think you're right. You know, if we all do our part, our, our own little part, then uh, we just keep spreading it as far as we can. So I'm trying to do my, my part. Well, you are, and that's very magnanimous of you to give back uh, that generously. Uh, thank you for that. Um, well, Rachel, it has been wonderful seeing you, hearing about for Fork's sake, uh, and uh, and getting to know you a little bit. And I wish you all the best going forward, and hopefully our paths will cross. Definitely. Thanks so much, Rip. It's been a pleasure. And uh, after following you for years, it's really fun to get to chat with you. So thank you so much. Yeah. So give me give me a a, a nice plant strong bump. Boom. All right. Keep it plant strong. For fork's sake, buy this book. It's available online or wherever you buy your books. And we'll be sure to put a link in the show notes for it. Until then, let's stop eating sad and start eating happy. How? By keeping it plant strong, of course. Talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to the Plant Strong Podcast. You can support the show by taking a quick minute to follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, leaving us a positive review and 
Sharing the show with your network is another great way to help us reach as many people as possible with the exciting news about plants. Thank you in advance for your support. It means everything. The Plant Strong podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Cryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.